I don't know why I didn't wake up the first time it happened. I must have been dead tired not to hear her baby steps walking down the hallway. She had to walk past my bedroom door, which was always cracked open since my wife died. Because before that, she was the one making sure everything was fine with Sarah. Sarah is my only daughter and the sole survivor of the car crash that took my wife. A hair of a miracle saved her. The car was totaled and the rescuers needed to use the jaws of life to get my wife and the baby out of the car. Sarah was about two when the accident happened. And she has no recollection of it. Thank God. She was in absolutely pristine condition when they brought her to the hospital. You know, outside of a bruise on her stomach and a light concussion caused by the impact, she was fine. My wife, however. Well, you know, anyway, I'm not here to talk about how my wife died. I'm here to talk about how that sleepwalking nightmare started. As I said, I sleep with the door cracked open. I used to keep it closed because my wife was a light sleeper, so she could always make sure Sarah was okay no matter what. At the first call for the sound of little feet slapping against the wooden floors, my wife always perked up and carried on to care for our daughter. I'm not a bad dad, I'm just a really heavy sleeper. It's been hard on me these past three years, raising our daughter and losing sleep to make sure she was fine. So when I said I missed it the first time, I must have been dead tired. I didn't miss it every other night though. Every night at around one in the morning, my daughter inexplicably got out of bed and walked down the hallway. The flat of her feet made small clapping noises as she walked barefooted through the house. And seeing how she was now five years old, I thought she was only going to the bathroom. That is, well, until I heard the sound of the sliding glass door. Now, I was only half awake when I heard it, so I didn't rush out of my room to see what the little shit was up to. I scratched my face and yawned, then I made my way to the kitchen. The door was open and my daughter was kneeling next to the orange tree that we have in our backyard. I observed her for a few minutes. She knelt, then stood up. She looked at the horizon for a minute or so, then walked around the tree three times before walking back towards the house. I moved aside as to not wake her up. I read somewhere that waking up someone from sleepwalking was dangerous. I didn't remember exactly why, but since she was coming back, there was nothing to worry about. I waited 15 minutes after she got back into bed to enter her room and clean her little feet from the grass and the dirt stuck to them. I didn't want to wake her up, so I was silent and delicate as possible. It had been weird to watch her do this little routine. Quite honestly, I didn't think much of it. It was just a little girl sleepwalking around a tree. And plus, I guess that I found it pretty touching, actually. Okay, so there's a detail I didn't mention about the tree. You see, it was her mother's tree. By that I mean that we planted it together after she requested it when we bought the house. It had grown quite a bit since then. But even as a tiny sapling, she loved this tree. When she died... I spread her ashes around it. I thought maybe, subconsciously, my daughter was looking for her mother. I wasn't much of a spiritual guy and didn't believe in ghosts or energies and all that jazz, but if my daughter felt her mother's presence through the tree and her subconscious got her sleepwalking there every night, who was I to stop her or to even be concerned? At least for a while, I thought. I could let her have her sleepwalking to her mother's tomb if it was something that didn't bother her daily activities. And it didn't seem to cause any distractions or anything. She was getting along fine with her little classmates at kindergarten, and she looked like a happy kid, despite growing up with only me as a dad. I just let it all happen. I even stopped the walking to the kitchen. 
she could open and close the door herself, and it seemed that even while sleepwalking, she never forgot to close the door. I simply observed her from my bedroom window to make sure she was fine and she was coming back, and if anything went wrong, I could always run to her. I'd be there in less time it needs to take a breath. I let it happen for a whole month. Yeah, I let it happen. For a whole month, I let it happen. I let my heart be touched and thought that my daughter was just going to see her mother. And maybe I held on to these illusions because they soothed my soul. Maybe I was the one with an ache that needed to be comforted after all. Because each time my daughter went out, I felt a little bit of relief. I felt like she was not alone with me anymore. And again, I don't think I'm a bad dad, but, you know, I think every child should have both parents. Am I wrong? But after the first month, and after realizing that it wouldn't help my daughter or me, I knew it was time to stop her. I didn't want to wake her up though, so I consulted with my doctor to know what would be the best way to deal with it. Should I lock the door of her room? Should I make sure that she can't open the door leading to the balcony? Should I sit down and have a talk with her? I had no idea where to start. My daughter's behavior hadn't really changed. She never talked about the tree and, and rarely about her mom. Sometimes she would look at the picture of her mother and ask me how she was, if she was kind and if she smelled nice. I would answer her that her mother smelled like oranges and happiness and that she had an open heart and the kindest smile. This always satisfied my daughter. And so again, I really didn't know how to bring it up with her that she'd been going to her mother's tree every single night. The doctor told me I should avoid shocking her, and I should probably sit down with her and ask her if she remembered what she did in her sleep. And so I did, and as expected, I didn't get a clear answer. And she told me about something watching her at the edge of the forest, and calling her name. She said the voice was sweet and reassuring, and I instantly thought of her mother, obviously. But when she said the edge of the forest, I was a bit taken aback. You see, our house is located at the edge of town. Behind our backyard is a grassy area, and just a bit further, there's the edge of a smaller forest. It's nothing impressive and not that big, but I wondered how my daughter could see it so far, especially in the night, considering how short she was, even if she climbed the tree. She couldn't possibly see the edge of the forest. It was a little too far, and so I asked her how she knew something was watching her from the forest. She stared at me for a second, and her gaze hardened a little, as if she was deeply processing her thoughts. Then she shrugged, and told me that she saw it in her head. Now, I regretted not stopping the sleepwalking earlier, and I was adamantly concerned about my daughter. I went back to the physician and brought her with me, but the visit didn't reassure me. My doctor told me that she was just a kid and that she had an imagination, that maybe she felt something around that tree that we couldn't feel. He knew about my wife and I shook my head, but that didn't explain why my daughter specified the edge of the forest. I decided to lock her way out from that moment onward. I couldn't lock her room door from the outside, but I could put a bar at the bottom of the sliding door to prevent it from opening. I did that, and the first night she sleepwalked and tried to open the door. I heard her nimble little steps down the hallway and sat at the edge of my bed. I knew she couldn't open the door. I knew she couldn't lift that bar so I wasn't too worried. I still sat at the edge of my bed listening intently to her movements to make sure she would return to her room. And then I heard something like pellets falling to the ground and something heavy slam against my glass door, repeatedly. I got out of bed and dashed out of my room, 
only to find my daughter using the cat's food bowl to try to break the door. I was shocked, but I quickly walked to her, grabbed her little wrist, and forced her to let go of the food bowl. She looked at me with an empty gaze, and I was glad I didn't wake her up during my little intervention, but now I had a mess to clean. She walked back to her room, closed the door, and went back to sleep as I cleaned up the cat food from the floor. Now the next night it didn't go any better. When I heard her little feet on the floor, I was up and I followed her. I'd already preemptively taken the bulls to the other side of the kitchen to make sure she couldn't see it. But she surprised me. Instead of going to the glass door, my daughter took a sharp turn at the end of the hallway and calmly walked down the stairs, one step at a time. I felt my heart tighten as I saw her fiddle with the lock of our main door. I don't know why, but I let her. I let her open the door, but this time I followed her outside. I walked right behind her as she circled our house and got to the door that leads to our backyard. She was so small, she couldn't reach the lock atop of it, and so I undid it for her and watched as she pushed it open, and it screeched a little. I followed my daughter to the backyard and then to a tree. She knelt, put her hands in the grass, and then stood up and stared at the horizon. I wondered what she was looking at, and then I remembered how she mentioned that something was staring at her from the edge of the forest. I turned my head in that direction, but my heart stopped when I heard her little voice. Do you see it, Daddy? She wasn't looking at me. She was staring straight in front of her. I turned my head, but I couldn't see anything at first. And then I saw it. A dark silhouette at the edge of the forest. I couldn't hear a word except for my daughter saying, It's calling me by my name. I saw something that must have been at least seven feet tall with limbs so long and so thin, it might have well even been a tree. I thought my eyes were fooling me. I thought I was looking at a regular tree and my eyes were playing tricks on me. It was night and it was far, and so it was hard to tell what was real and what was my imagination, but we both stared at this moving form in the distance as it leaned against the tree at the edge of the forest. I don't think I blinked for a whole minute, just trying to figure out what the hell I was seeing. And when I blinked, my eyes burned, and I saw the creature so clearly in my mind. It only made, Daddy, do you see it? Sound a little creepier when my daughter spoke again. And I saw it as I see you, clear as day despite the night. It was tall and decimated, but carried a long beard at its chin. The hair was sparse, matted and grayed out, and the beast's eyes were hollow and white. Its face was so emaciated I could define its cheekbones, its maw and teeth through its skin. The shape of its skull was something crossed between a moose and a human, with a prominent nose but the upper half of the face looking humanoid. I couldn't see horns or antlers, but maybe it was only because of the branches in the background fusing me. I could see the creature's spine through holes in its neck and torso. Bugs were falling out of a cavity on its chest and its rib cage was apparent. There was also mold growing on the beast's legs, and long claws, sharp as eagle talons, at the top of each finger and feet. It looked like an elk who lived far past its time, died and then revived, and decided to haunt the edge of my forest. My heart rose in my throat as it opened its mouth and a thick, slobbering gray tongue passed on its lips. I didn't see where his eyes were looking, but I felt it was looking at my daughter. 
I turned around to grab Sarah, and she turned her head slowly toward me. She was still sleeping. I didn't want to wake her up, but between that and the monster, I didn't have much of a choice. She doesn't want me to go. Her little voice stopped me in my tracks. My daughter then started walking around the tree, one hand always on the bark. She made her usual three turns and then walked back towards our house, leaving me a little confused and terrified. I could feel the coldness of my sweat soaking my clothes. My t-shirt was stuck to my skin and I felt gross. She doesn't want me to go. I looked back at the forest just in time to hear a wretched scream and see something disappear into the dead of night. She doesn't want me to go. That's what my daughter said before she circled the tree three times and went back inside. Something was definitely preventing her from leaving our backyard and going straight to that creature who was calling for her. And that night... I knelt at the bottom of the tree, and I thanked her, in the top of her grave for protecting our daughter. She was still with us. <laughs>